So my father would probably add to the line of successes that I have at least a pre-diploma in physics, which is probably more important when it comes to speak about data, especially in front of the experts. But I just want to give you uh, some insight from an athlete perspective on data because sometimes it's a little bit different um, than yeah, from, a, from a trainer or a scientist perspective. I've been doing triathlon for more than 25 years now and 12 of them as a professional. Um, for those who don't know, triathlon is a combination of the three most popular endurance sports, swimming, cycling and running. In 2014, like it already has been said, I won the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii. It's 3.8k swimming, 180k on the bike and the marathon. So that's uh, plenty of time to collect some data. <laughs> and um, as triathletes, we have been using and collecting data for, for quite a long time. I remember my first uh, Polar watch. Um, had like this funny sonic link system where you have to place it in front of a microphone to upload data onto the computer and it started to make sounds like some sort of a crazy bug. Um, nowadays it's uh, way easier and that's probably also the reason why uh, this whole topic of variable technology and collecting data actually hit the press, the mainstream media I would say in 2019. Um, so when, when I started, um, I think it was, it was just for, for freaks to co collect all this, this data. Now a random guy uh, yesterday in the gym told me about his, his uh, HRV and whatever, how many uh, uh, REM sleep phases he had last night and stuff like that. So the question sometimes um, really is why do we, uh, do we collect all this data? And I think one of the reasons why it became such a big topic is that the next step we took in, in wearable technology and data is not to accumulate more data and more sources of data, but that now we have the software um, together with um, yeah, big data analysis and um, artificial intelligence to actually analyze these masses of data and give the user more valuable um, recommendations. And yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it pretty much hit the mainstream media this year. Um, I don't know if we can actually start playing the video. Maybe some of you already uh, know this. I was born in that year. And of course, I was motivated for quite a long time um, from all the, uh, the, the Rocky movies. I think this is uh, Rocky IV. And we see uh, Rocky is uh, training with his heart and uh, in, in the outdoors. and. The bad Russians, of course they are bad, um, they had the Sputnik first, so uh, they're training with um, what looks like super modern technology and, and uh, using science to, uh, to have an advantage. And um, so it makes look data sort of bad. And um, yes, I think I agree, sometimes data can be also a bad thing because it can be used for surveillance or to, to put uh, mental pressure on an, on an athlete. For example, our first coach, he always collected all the heart rate monitors after each session. And of course, we assume that he is checking if anybody took any shortcuts. And probably that's not true, but that's what he thought. I know stories about coaches that put their athletes on a scale in front of the whole squad. And that puts immense pressure on, on the athlete. My coach uses a data analyzing system, it's called WKO, and sometimes I have the feeling it sets me KO, because what it does, it um, uh, predicts the power you should be able to deliver um, based on the latest training sessions. And if you have this super exact um, uh, prediction of what you should able to deliver power-wise, on a VO2 max set and you can't deliver that power, it feels like losing. So it can be pretty, uh, pretty tough sometimes if you have exact data. 
But on the other hand, um, the coach can use the data for good. So, for example, to prevent overtraining, recognize eating disorders, or uh, optimize the training load. And that's just a glimpse of the data we collect. Of course, it's uh, much, much more. And um, some of the stuff we, uh, we try to look at is just once or twice a year. Um, some of the things are just very irregular. I think the biggest things in the last five or ten years is power meters in cycling and uh, in the last three, four years, power meters also for running. So it's always important um, to, uh, to have a good quality of data and to know what data you want to, to use for, for what. And here are some of the examples. Um, of course, I think the most important thing really is the, the, the sport watch. Um, I mean, it has probably more computing power than the Russians had in their lab in 1984. And um, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, sometimes we use specific tools to collect data, for example, for a sponsor. Um, I have a collaboration with uh, New Balance, for example, my running shoe uh, sponsors, and they, they uh, provided me uh, uh, with the stride system, for example, so they really try to find a shoe um, for me that was helping me with a lot of problems I had in the past four years with my Achilles. And so they collected a lot of data and sent me constant samples. And um, so that makes it easier because you don't have to go to a lab sometimes. And every now and then we try to evaluate the quality of the data that is... Um, yeah, sourced from tools like that to find out if this is actually valuable, valuable or not. And um, the next graph is a, is a pretty good, good example for that. That's actually my uh, marathon from this year's race in, in Kona. <clears throat> and especially with running, it's very important to, to know what, what source of metric you use in which situation. Of course, when you are in a lab-like environment, like a track, it would be stupid to use heart rate, for example, because you can measure time really, really well. And when you do shorter intervals, it's just not reacting quick enough. But then on a race like Hawaii, where heat is a big factor, and I already realized I definitely have to stay for the next um, presentation <laughs> because that's important for me as well. Um, it's more important to look at heart rate because the heat is one of the biggest stressors in this race. And it's quite interesting actually to see that the lower graph, the heart rate graph, is not really moving upwards, but actually moving down. That's due to a couple of factors. We did a lot of testing before the, the race when it comes to healing, uh, he, yeah, to healing strategies as well, but uh, to cooling uh, strategies. The um, blue curve, of course, of course is, the, is the speed, but you also want to look at the power curve, for example, because you have a lot of situations in Hawaii where you have a headwind or a hill, and therefore uh, the pace is not really valuable. So I think one of the like I said, one of the big developments is um, using uh, power as a, as a metric also in running. There's another graph, and this one is actually uh, from a training session already uh, leading up to the, to the race in, uh, in Hawaii, in, in Maui. So it's similar conditions when we talk about the, the climate conditions. And um, compared to the last graph, you can actually see quite well, because I haven't done a bike ride before, I started the run with a pretty low core temperature. So the red curve is the, is the heart rate curve, the orange curve is the power curve, and you can see that the gap is closing really fast. So I did a couple of intervals, and towards the end you can see that um, the red curve, the heart rate curve is almost crossing the power curve or is crossing the power curve. And there you see that, um, that it's one of the big challenges is to keep the, the yeah, temperature, the core temperature down in those, in those training sessions and also to look at the, at the right metrics. And in this case, especially uh, when, when I do the training sessions in Hawaii, you come from Europe, you're used that you, you are able to run, for example, a 345 pace per K when you have 160 uh, heart rate. 
and then you go to, to Maui and your heart rate is about 15 to 18 beats higher at the same pace. And so it's important to realize that you actually want to measure heart rate as well, even if some people think it's a little bit outdated. For us, it's still a um, pretty big value. And um, yeah, so uh, that's just um, some of the, of the things, of course. And uh, I think in the future, there, there will be a much more opportunity, especially with 5G networks, more computing power, and um, even yeah, um, smarter devices. Um, it will be possible to get real life feedback on your session. So I start an interval on the bike, for example, and the program realizes, oh, you are not 100% recovered, and it gives you instant recommendations on how, on what power you want to do the next uh, interval. And uh, the same goes for uh, for injury prevention. I think, of course, there's a lot of research currently in this this uh, topic, but I'm pretty sure if we have enough data and if we have the the right um, guys um, thinking about this topic, then it will probably, it would be a dream for us athletes to be able to have valuable data at what point we have to be careful, for example, with a stress fracture and so on. And I think if we are able to deliver enough data like DEXA scan with bone density and um, of course your, your running uh, stride and contact times and everything, probably a software will be able to realize when you are probably limping or whatsoever. And I think that would be uh, something great for, for us athletes. And um, so therefore it's not just there to enhance our performance and to get better and better and better, but also yeah, to be more healthy. And especially in our sport, that's a really important thing because I have a pretty big window to be at the, at the top. Yeah. So I see the countdown is about to run down, but I still want you to, to give you uh, um, at least two op opportunities to ask questions, if you have any. <laughs> I believe for great. First, some hands for him. <laughs>